Now we are on to Bond Features. Oh, bless you. When you stifle a sneeze like that, you run a chance of blowing a gasket. So you just really got to let it out. Okay, so let's talk about Bond Features. I have this new clicker. Let's see if it works. Hell no. What is that? It would help if I turned it on. Woo, there we go. Okay, so let's talk about bond features. First of all, I want you to recognize that debt is not an ownership claim. Remember, the ownership claim at the firm is the equity, and for corporations, that's the shareholders. Equity is an ownership claim. Equity gets to make decisions about what we're doing. Debt is not an ownership claim, and as long as we are living up to our borrower's agreement, they can't really tell us what to do. That's the decision of the equity holders. The company's paying of interest is considered a cost of doing business. So this is different than our payment of dividends on equity. Remember with uh, dividends that uh, you can see it on the income statement. It gets calculated long after the taxes are calculated, but your interest shows up there before the calculation of taxes. It gets subtracted out. And so that's a benefit that debt has that equity does not. We know that unpaid debt is a liability of the firm, and you may have not thought of the word liability before and what it means. It's a legal obligation to pay. It's a legal obligation to pay. And that means if you don't pay as a borrower that the lender can use legal means, the courts, to force some action on your part. If you don't pay, by the way, let's make this a real simple one. Assume you borrow money on a car. What is the security for the car, or for the loan? It's the car, right? And if you don't make your car payments, what happens? You guys ever watch that show Operation Repo? They send that unpleasant woman with all the tattoos to take your car back, right? Now, it's not just cars. What if you've got a big factory that you borrowed a bunch of money for and it's on a, on a, a bond that's secured by that? Well, they can come and take the factory, take possession of it. But that's the only time that the lender gets control of the assets and gets to make decisions is if you default on the debt. Okay, back to short term versus long term. We talked about this back in chapter two-ish. Um, short term debt is uh, one year or less. Long term debt goes out longer than that. And then we break down the long term into notes and bonds. Notes are up from one year up to 10 years, and then bonds are anything beyond 10 years. Now notice it says original issue maturity. That means on the day that this thing was issued, how many years was there left to maturity? And so don't assume that a bond, a 30 year bond after 20 years is going to turn into a note. If you're born a bond, you die a bond. You don't turn into a note magically 20 years into your life. It doesn't work that way. That's why we call it original issue maturity. Are there any questions? Okay, let's talk about the bond indenture. An indenture is a contract. So write contract next to bond indenture. You might also think of it as an agreement, but that's on the slide there, an agreement between the borrower and the lender. Now, when you have borrowed money in the past, let's say you went to the bank to borrow money, or you borrowed money at the car lot to buy a car. Who wrote the contract, the borrower or the lender? Yeah, the lender. They pushed a bunch of papers across the desk to you, and your choice was either sign, get the car, or walk away. Literally, walk away, because you don't have a car, right? That's it. Now, bonds are different. Bonds are freaky. With bonds, it's the borrower that writes the contract. It's the borrower that writes the contract. And the reason that is, is because there's one borrower and many lenders. Let's assume that I'm the borrower and you guys are the lenders. I could go out and ask each one of you, what would you like to see 
in the bond contract. And you would tell me something. And then I would come over here to Miss Flowers and I'd say, what would you like to see in the bond contract? And you would tell me something a little different. And I could go through the whole room and I would wind up with this hodgepodge of things and I could never satisfy all of you. I'm quite confident of that. It's exactly the same way when a company is issuing debt. And so what do they do instead? They come up with an indenture, a bond contract, an agreement that they think will be attractive to the most possible lenders and that meets their needs and doesn't constrain them unnecessarily. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a package of things together that I think is attractive enough to gather enough bondholders to buy my bonds that I can get the money that I need to do whatever project it is I'm trying to get into, right? So that is why we see these bond contracts being written by the borrower instead of by the lenders because there's just too many lenders that we could never satisfy them all. So we just want to come up with something that is attractive enough that I can attract enough borrower or lenders that I get the money I need. Now there's all these things that show up in there and I'm not going to read these off so you can read them for yourself and I have a slide for each one of them. So let's get into that. I got the clicker in my hand. I still walk behind the computer. First one is face value. Now remember, I told you, unless I tell you otherwise, you are to assume the face value is how much? A thousand bucks. Do you think lawyers are going to allow us to get by with, hey, everybody knows it's a thousand bucks? Heck no. We're going to have to have a thousand dollars written out there in ink. Secondly, the coupon rate. And not only the coupon rate, but whether or not, the, or whether those uh, coupons are paid semi-annually or annually. We know that typically most bonds are semi-annual, but we've got to say that in the terms of the bond issue. And then we say the maturity date. We've got to put the maturity date in there so people will know how long the life of this bond will be. And then we have to talk about the form of the bond. And here's where we get into some fun stuff. We have registered bond versus bearer bonds. Back in the day, when bonds were all paper, they were all bearer bonds. And the bearer bonds all had these coupons, which we've already talked about, that had to be clipped off and turned in. And the interest and the face value were paid to the bearer of the bond. Who would the bearer of the bond be? So, at a, at a wedding, we have this little kid with a pillow. He's called the ring bearer, not the ring bear. Those are more vicious. Uh, ring bearer. He's, and why is he called the ring bearer? He's, gonna the ring. He's the one that's got the ring, right? Now, no one really trusts the kid with the ring. It's fake, right? But the idea is the same. It's whoever has their hands on this bond is the bearer. And so it makes it really easy if I wanted to sell my bond to Ms. Herdman, she just pays me the money, I hand her the bond, bada bing, bada boom, now she's the owner of the bond. And she goes in to collect the next coupon, right? No big deal, it's really easy. Now let's talk about what the potential dangers of bearer bonds are. Let's say you're a bearer bond bearer. You've got one right now. What could happen that would make your life miserable? You could lose it. You could be out taking your bearer bond for a ride on your bicycle. Strong wind comes up. Your bearer bond blows away. You, you try to chase him down, but you can't find it. It's just gone. Very good. What else? You robbed. You robbed. So uh, you, you, uh, you get a bearer bond. You take it home. You put it between the mattress and the box springs in your guest room. Your nephew comes for a visit. He's looking between the mattress and the box spring for pictorial stimulation or whatever you know, kids do these days. Anyway, but he finds your bearer bond and he's been watching my YouTube videos. So he's like, phew, I know what that is. Bloop. Thanks uncle, right? Now, what else? What else could happen? Anybody in here smoke? No one's got to confess to smoking. 
I guess I guess the kids all babe today. Whatever. So, uh, so, so old folks like me, you know, you, you go out and get really, not me personally, but you go out, you get really sauced because I've never smoked. And you, you come home and you're having that one last cigarette after the night. And what happens? Yeah, you're laying there on the mattress with your Benson and Hedges. And before long, your bed's on fire and whoop, you leap out of bed. You're like, whoa, that was lucky. And then you realize, crap. My bearer bond was between the mattress and the box springs. Now, don't worry. You just call up General Electric, the issuer of the bond, and you say, hey, my bond, you know, it's kind of drunk. My bond got burned up between my mattress and my box springs. Could you all send me another one? What are they going to say? No way, man. If that worked, I'd be making that call every day. Phew, happened again. Send me another bond. So, you're just out of luck if you lose the bond. And so, so far, bearer bonds are sounding like a really bad deal, right? Now, let's talk about how they could be a good deal if you were a criminal. First of all, if you want to move a large amount of cash and you don't want it to be recognized as cash, you could buy bearer bonds and put them in a briefcase you're going through walking across the border to Tijuana. You open up the briefcase, and the uh, the border guard says, "Who are these?" You say, "Oh, well, these are this is my collection of uh, financial art. You know, I, I just collect these for the pictures. Look at the pictures. By the way, bonds usually have beautiful pictures on. I don't know why." And the guy's like, "Wow, that's really cool." And he's like, "Hey, some of these people are naked. <laughs> I don't know why, but there are a lot of naked people on bonds." Don't ask me. Probably not the newer ones. They probably have like bikinis and whatnot. But I know the story. So, you walk across the border into Mexico where you now retire and you use $100,000 worth of your bonds to buy citizenship in Mexico, even though that's theoretically impossible. It can happen. And now, what do you do? When you want some money, you just take your coupons down to your local bank branch and, of course, minus the small fee, they'll give you the money and you can live off the money on your bearer bonds. So, or you could just sell them for cash when you get there, right? And so this would be one way you could use bearer bonds to say launder money. Am I telling you to launder money? Absolutely. Going to prison sucks. Okay, now, on with the story. What else could you do with bearer bonds? Well, prior to September 11th, 2001, uh, bearer bonds, there was no... There were no records kept as to who got paid the interest. If you have the other kind of bond, a registered bond, they have your name, they have your address, they have your birthday, they have your social security number. And as soon as they send you a coupon, what do you think happens? They report it to the IRS. And when you fill out your tax forms at the end of the year, if you don't report that, guess what? They're going to be on you like a pig on slop, right? They're, the IRS is going to be all over you asking you, hey, why didn't you report your bond interest? And so what does that mean? It means people generally report their bond interest and they generally pay taxes on it. But if it was a bearer bond prior to September 11th, 2001, then uh, you could use it to cheat on your taxes if you want. Now, I keep mentioning September 11th, 2001. What happened then? Some of you guys weren't even alive, were you? I remember it. I remember exactly where I was. I was in a cubicle listening to my, the, the ladies in the next uh, cubicle discuss disgusting things, right? I'm like, ladies, I'm here. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Don't, never mind. So, on with the story. Uh, there was a terrorist attack, right? Um, are terrorists self funded? You may have not thought about this before. But do terrorists, you know, they like have a day job where they're making their money so they can go do bad things? No, someone else is usually funding them. And so after September 11th, we're trying to crack down on the sources of funding for terrorism. And one of the ways that we do that is we say, well, hey, we're going to plug this bearer bond hole. So now anytime you take your coupon in and you get some money, they say, oh, yeah, here you go. But before I give you the money, what's your name? What's your address? What's your birthday? What's your social security number? And afterwards, what do I do? Report it to the IRS. And so now that has been plugged 
in the United States. But guess what? In Europe, last I heard, you can still do this. You can still cheat on your taxes. And in fact, there are some bonds in Europe called uh, Euro dollar bonds. And they're basically, they, they're uh, bearer bonds that only pay coupons annually. And that's because you don't want to have to make more than one to trip to Geneva per year to get your money. Isn't that freaky? And by, by the way, while you're there, you can ski, right? So it's all good. Okay, now, most of the bonds today are registered bonds. And they're going to electronically deposit the coupon into your account. And they're going to report that information to the government. And it doesn't matter if your house burns down, if you get robbed, if you just lose your bond. It doesn't matter. In fact, you probably will never physically hold the bond in your hand because the bonds are held in electronic form. United States government debt has been in nothing but electronic form, except for this freaky little savings bonds, since 1977. So if you buy a treasury bill, a treasury note, a treasury bond, they are all going to be in electronic form. And they are all stored on a computer at the treasury, which makes me wonder what would happen if someone accidentally kicked the plug on that computer. Would, we, would the national debt just disappear? I don't know. But hey, I am impressed. It kept that thing going since 1977. Questions? I keep coming over even though I've got a clicker. Okay, so now let's talk about the security on the loan. Security is what the lender can take if the borrower doesn't pay. It's what the lender can take if the borrower doesn't pay. And we talked about the car loan earlier. And if you don't pay on the car loan, they take your car. If you don't pay on a house loan, what do they do? They take your house, it's called foreclosure. Now it's a little easier to repossess a car because cars can be moved. Houses, not so much, right? And so basically they have to post a notice on your door and tell you to get out and we're gonna be here 30 days from now. And what happens if 30 days from now you're still there? They bring in the sheriff and some burly guys and they throw all your crap into the yard and they change the locks. Do you guys know that? It's kind of rough, isn't it? Yeah, so pay your mortgage so you don't have to find out personally. Okay, now we tend to use the word collateral to talk about the car and the house in these loans, but for bonds it has a very specific kind of meaning. It is a collection of financial securities. It's a collection of financial securities or a basket of financial securities that the bond holder can take if the bond issuer doesn't pay. And of course, we want the financial securities in that basket to be safer than the borrower. So typically we're looking at United States government debt, which is theoretically default free, but it could be the debt of a safer company. So if I had a bunch of bonds from say Apple, then I could put those bonds out as collateral. If I, if I didn't want to just sell those outright and use the money, I could use those as collateral and issue my own bond. Now, would you ever see the company's stock as collateral for its bonds? No, why not? Yeah, it's riskier. Keep in mind, if they can't pay the bondholders, there's definitely no money left over for the shareholders. So why in the world would I want your lousy stock if your bonds aren't even any good? Now, let's, let's think this through though. There's one example where, it, because there's always an exception, right? Do you guys remember Toys R Us? Yeah, Toys R Us, uh, they went through a rough patch. In fact, they died. They, they went bankrupt. But in the meantime, they were trying to stay alive and they actually borrowed some money and they used the stock of Canadian Toys R Us as security for the bonds of U.S. Toys R Us. Why? Because apparently Canadians still go to toy stores and the business was going well in Canada. It was valuable. And so the stock of the riskier, of the, of the Canadian firm was actually less risky than the bonds of the American. That's the only time I've ever heard of anyone using stock as security for a bond, as collateral. 
Then we have mortgage securities. If I say the word mortgage, what do you picture in your head that I bought? Yeah, a house. Well, it turns out it's not just houses. You can buy factories, uh, skyscrapers, things like that. And as long as that debt is backed by real property, land, or a building, then it can be called a mortgage security. Now, the neat thing about security is these people don't have to wait in line at bankruptcy. Remember, we've, we've talked before about the line at bankruptcy. But if you've got a loan secured by a skyscraper in Midtown Manhattan and the borrower goes bankrupt, you can go ahead and start proceedings and just grab that skyscraper. The stuff that is not subject to secure to being security for a loan is goes into that general asset pile that gets sold off and then gets paid out to the unsecured investors. And in the United States, the debenture, a debenture is an unsecured bond. If you have a bond with no security whatsoever, that's the debenture. Now, people would say, well, there is security. Uh, it's backed by the assets of the firm. Well, it's backed by the non-secured assets of the firm. And so that's, uh, I mean, notice I say in the U.S. though. In the U.K., for whatever reason, they think that an adventure is backed by something. So if you decide to move to Britain, which I don't know if any of you will, but uh, just watch out for that. So we mentioned notes earlier, and we talked about purely in terms of their time to maturity, but it's good to know that notes are also unsecured. Notes are also unsecured. Questions? Okay, which is riskier, a firm that has, or a bond that has security or a bond that is unsecured? Yeah, if it's got security, it's less risky because if they don't pay, you still have a chance of getting some money back. Does that make sense? You have a really good chance of getting money back. If you have an unsecured bond, you still have a chance of getting money back, but you are further back in the line, right? You're not able to go in there and get it first thing when they declare bankruptcy. And so what does that mean for the yield to maturity of these bonds? Which is going to have a higher yield to maturity, a debenture or a mortgage security? Oh, swing and a miss. Which is going to have a higher yield to maturity? It's got to be the riskier one. Which one's riskier? Debenture. Yes, yeah, the debenture. And so the unsecured debt is going to have a higher yield to maturity because it is riskier. Unsecured debt is going to have a higher yield to maturity because it is riskier. Questions? I'll wait till you stop writing. Say that one more time. Unsecured debt must have a higher YTM because it is riskier. Okay, now let's talk about seniority. Anybody here work a job where seniority was important? So, what is seniority? And by the way, seniority just means time on the job, right? Mm -hmm. What does seniority get for you at your job? Um, for my job, it's job security. Okay, so you'll not, you won't be the first one out the door because you've been there a while. Right. Okay. Sweet. Okay. Uh, what about scheduling vacations? Um, yeah, the lower, I mean, I wouldn't say lower. Yeah. The lower folks and stuff, they would have to go by seniority if somebody else, somebody's wanting the same vacation. Yeah. So who gets off between Christmas and New Year's? Yeah. She does, right? <laughs> Okay, now, uh, when I was a grocery sacker, we had seniority system, and it was uh, the most senior people got to take their break first. And then the most senior guy, oh, he was such a jerk, he would wait until like 15 minutes before close, at the end of shift. He's like, okay, I'm going to take my break. I meant none of us got a break. What a jerk. I think he's, well, never mind. Uh, I was going to tell you where I think he is today. That's not good. Okay, so back to the story. Seniority also happens for bonds. Seniority also happens for bonds. And we have the most, 
senior bonds are called senior bonds. <laughs> yeah. Now, what does seniority get for you if you're a bond and you are the most senior bond? Well, you get paid coupons before the other bonds. So the most senior bonds get paid first. And when we have bankruptcy, the most senior bonds, they get paid off before anybody down the line of seniority gets any money. So in this whole pecking order of, of people getting money, the senior debt holders are first in line for debt holders. And you might have guessed if we're going to have senior bonds, we're going to have junior bonds. Now, the junior bonds, it's not like the junior cheeseburger where these are like smaller bonds. It doesn't work like that. It just means that they are behind. They have less preference for coupons and assets at liquidation than the senior bonds. And then at the very back of the line, as far as bond holders go, we have subordinated bonds. Subordinated bond holders only get paid if senior bond holders and junior bond holders have been paid everything that they are owed. Now, knowing how this order works, which one of these is the riskiest? Subordinated, and which one is the safest? senior. Therefore, which one has to have the highest yield to maturity? Yeah, subordinated it has to have the highest yield to maturity simply because it is the riskiest. It has to have the highest yield to maturity because it's the riskiest. Questions? Okay, now let's talk about repayment with bonds. You guys are used to car loans and house loans, which are amortized loans, which means that every payment represents both principal and interest. And so over the life of the loan, you are paying down the loan, and so the amount of principal keeps decreasing. But keep in mind that bonds are an interest-only loan. All those coupons that I pay along the way, those are just interest. The principal remains all outstanding until the very end. Now, when do you think a bond is most likely to be defaulted on? For these $30 coupons along the way, or for that last chunk of money, 1,030 bucks? Which one's more likely to push the company into default? Yeah, the last one, right? You guys can make the little payments, but you get to the big stuff and you're like, woo! Totally understandable. Now, Bond investors understand that as well. So something that makes a bond indenture more attractive to them is just for you to say, well, wait a minute, we're going to pay down the principal over the life of this bond issue. But we can't do it by saying, okay, here's $100, now I only owe you $900. Here's $100, now I only owe you $900. You can't do that. That's not the way bonds work. So instead of trying to pay down 10% of everybody's principal, what I'm going to do is buy back 10% of the bonds. Ms. Gash, you really need to get more sleep. You really need to get <laughs> back to the story. Yeah, so you can't do this. So what am I going to do? I'm going to buy back the bonds. And it's really, really easy if the bonds are traded in the open market. All I have to do is go out and buy 10% of the bonds back at the current market value. Looks like you need a nap too. Am I really that boring? Or do you guys just stay up late partying? I'm hoping it's the partying, right? Okay, so how do we go about this then? Well, we've set up something called a sinking fund. If we are to issue new bonds, we say we are floating the issue. If we issue new bonds, we say we are floating the issue. What's the opposite of floating as far as ships are concerned? Sinking. Sinking. And so any fund that we have that is dedicated to getting rid of the principal on these bonds will be called a sinking fund. And this sinking fund, the bond issuer promises to put a certain amount of money into that fund on a periodic basis and that money will be used to buy back certain amounts of the bonds. Now the sinking fund is administered by someone called the bond trustee. Now, by the way, the bond trustee is a third party. It's not bond holder, it's not bond issuer, it's a third party. But 
is hired by the bond issuer. So eh, who knows, right? We know that the incentives can be a little weird. Okay, so what do they do? They pay the money to the bond trustee and the bond trustee goes out in the market and buys these things back. Now, not all bonds are publicly traded though. And so sometimes, so the only other way that you would be able to do this is if the bond had a call provision, which means you can force the bondholder to sell their bond back. And we'll talk about those here in a little bit. Okay, so this sinking fund reduces the risk of the bond issue for bondholders. Why is that? Let's say the fund, the, the bonds, there were a thousand bonds and I got a thousand face value apiece, so we got a million dollars outstanding. With no sinking fund at the end, these people have to pay a million dollars in principal. But if we have a sinking fund and every year over 10 years, they buy back 10% every year, uh, at first they've got the full million, then they've got 900,000, 800,000, 700,000, and so forth, until at the end, how much do they owe? 100,000 bucks, right? What's more likely for them to be able to pay one million or 100,000? 100,000, right? And so this makes the bond less risky for the bond holder because there's not this huge wad of principal at the end that has to be paid. As a result, what would we expect the yield to maturity on two otherwise identical bonds to be if one had sinking fund versus the other. Would the sinking fund be higher yield, yield of maturity or lower? Yeah, it's got to be lower because it's less risky. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now we're going to talk about the call provision. We're going to get into call options before this class is over, and this is the first example we see of it. The call provision gives you gives the bond issuer, that's the borrower, the right, but not the obligation, by the way, that's the definition of an option, the right, but not the obligation, to purchase, to repurchase the bond at a set amount, which is, we call the call premium, that's the amount above face value. Typically, it's like one year's worth of coupons would be, or maybe six months worth of coupons, but it's all there in the bond indenture. Now, what does that mean? If they want to, want you, want, they want to force you to sell your bond back, they're going to have to give you 1,030 or 1,060, uh, whatever this number is. By the way, they typically issue bonds to try to get them to sell at 1,000. And so that means you're making a profit off of this deal. So you might be happy about it. But on the other hand, let's talk about what makes it worthwhile for them to call these bonds if they don't need them for this sinking fund idea. And the answer is dropping interest rates. Because as interest rates drop, what happens to bond prices? They go up. Yeah, they go up. And so you're watching your bond and you're all happy because the value of your bond's going up and now you're up to 1,037 and the call premium is 30 and you get this check in the mail for 1,030 bucks. And it says, you've been called, here's your check, have a nice life. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But that's, that's the general idea. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. I thought my bond was worth 1037 Well, it was, but because interest rates fell, it made it worthwhile. Now, they made a profit of 7 bucks over this whole transaction. Does that make sense? Now, where did they get the money to do that? Well, they just go out and borrow new money at a lower interest rate and call your bonds. So this is like refinancing your mortgage. Does that make sense? Now... That means that if a bond has a call provision, it increases the risk to the bondholder. Let me say that again. If a bond has a call provision, it increases the risk for the bondholder because there's a chance you might get called out. And the time that you get called out is the absolute worst time because interest rates are down now we have this reinvestment risk problem. You're going to go out there to reinvest that money, but you're not going to be able to get the same kind of return you were getting out of the bond previously. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, as a result, what do you think 
has to occur with yield and maturity for a bond with a call provision. Yeah, it's got to be higher, right? So I have a sad, sad story to illustrate this point. I forget when this was, but it was one of those situations where, um, so the, the year was, if you guys, you guys were, don't, you weren't even around. In 1981, interest rates were very high. And so any bonds issued in 81 would have had pretty big coupons on them. So there's a story in the Wall Street Journal, I think this is 2000, early 2002, story in the Wall Street Journal about these little old ladies, because women tend to outlive men, right? So uh, little old ladies retired down in Florida, and uh, their bonds had matured, and they had been getting like 12% coupons, because they were from this like 1981 time frame. But then when they go down to reinvest the money, the guy offers them 6% coupons for similar risk bonds. Now, keep in mind, these little old ladies are probably depending on these bonds for their income plus you know, Social Security. So what does that mean to their non-Social Security income? It's going to be cut in half. What do you think the little old lady said? Don't you have anything with a higher return than that? And the broker says, well, I got these bonds over here. They're, they're fairly similar. They pay six and a quarter percent coupons. And the little old lady say six and a quarter is better than 6%, so might as well. And so they get these six and a quarter percent bonds and then they go home and they're happy for a couple of years, but interest rates fall further. And then they get the dreaded letter in the mailbox that says, here's a check, your bond's been called, have a nice life. Now the little old ladies hadn't bothered to read the bond indenture before they bought these bonds. So they had no idea what's going on. So they all pile in the Buick, because you know it was, and they drive down to the broker and they're like, what the hell does this mean? And the broker says, oh, do you remember I offered you the six and a quarter bonds versus the six? And he says, well, these six and a quarter bonds, they have what's called a call provision. And he gives them a quick little lesson on what a call provision is. This story ends in the most tragic way. One of the little old ladies is talking about the financial strain that this has put on her life. She says, it's so bad. I can only afford to eat at the country club once per week. Isn't that awful? Brings a tear to your eye. Now, why do I tell you that story? It illustrates the dangers of the call provision. It lets you know they have to have a higher yield to maturity because they are riskier. Gotta start learning to use the clicker. <laughs> Let's, here's, here's my hope. I'll have that figured out by the end of the semester. Let's talk about protective covenants. A covenant is like a promise only stronger. In my neighborhood, we have restrictive covenants, like um, I'm not allowed to have a big ceramic clown in my front yard. That would violate our architectural standards. In fact, now I'm the head of the architecture committee and uh, I'm going to have to go after some people for their Christmas lights still being up in March. Okay, so what are covenants? They're promises that we make to each other. And so in this case, it's the promises that the bond issuer is making to the lenders. Now, keep in mind, it's the bond issuer that is putting together this uh, indenture. They get to select the covenants. So that why would they include a covenant? Because a covenant makes it less risky to the bond holder, therefore they will demand less in the way of yield, therefore it'll be less costly to borrow money. Does that make sense? We're gonna try to lower our cost of borrowing money by lowering that yield maturity, which means that I can pay lower coupons and still sell it at face value. Now, I don't want to promise, I don't want to make promises that will restrict me in a way that will prevent me from doing the business I wanted to do anyway. But if I had no plans to do something evil, I could go ahead and promise not to do that thing and get a resultant reduction in the yield to maturity. And so you got to be careful when you choose these covenants. In fact, I liken it to the buffet. Um, I'm a picky eater, so when I go to the buffet, uh, there are very few things that I actually pick out, right? 
my wife is actually will eat green things, so she always gets some like salad and whatnot, some other stuff. But the point is, we're only picking out the things that we like. We don't have to try some of everything. And that's exactly what's going on here. And all these covenants that we're talking about, none of them have to be in the bond covenant. They are all just put there if the borrower wants to put them there and thinks that they will give them an advantage. And of course they will because they reduce risk. <laughs> Negative covenants say what the bond issuer is not allowed to do. So these are like the thou shalt nots. And then the uh, positive covenants say what the bond issuer must to do. So these are the thou shalts if you're into Old English. So let's talk about some examples of negative covenants. First of all, firms must limit dividend payments. Wait a minute, dividend payments go to the shareholders. Why would the bondholders care one bit? Any ideas? Yeah, so the shareholders are over here. I want to make sure that, uh, by the way, dividends reduce the amount of cash we have. I want to make sure there's still enough cash to pay my coupon before those clowns get paid, right? And so maybe we limit it to a percentage of the earnings. You're only allowed to pay out 40% of your earnings as dividends. And that way there will be enough money left over to pay not only my div uh, coupons, but hopefully at the end, the face value. By the way, do you think firms actually just save up money and then pay off the bonds at the end? How do they pay, how do they pay off the bonds at the end? What do they usually do? Yeah, they borrow more money. By the way, this is the way your government works too, right? In your government, and oh, where's Mr. Wong? His government too. By the way, they the, the debt matures. Do you think that they've been saving up and they're getting going to pay it? No, they just borrow more money. And, and well, anyway. So at least we want to make sure that they've got enough money to make the coupon payments. The other thing is I could be a total scumbag if I didn't have this covenant. I could sell a bunch of bonds to you guys and then uh, pay out that money to my shareholders as a dividend and declare bankruptcy. Total scumbag move. That's another reason that you would like this to be in a bond covenant or in a bond indenture that you are purchasing. Firms can't pledge assets to other lenders. Remember that we said that um, secured debt, that's secured by stuff, right? And so those assets are already pledged. But what if I'm buying unsecured debt? That's basically just by the, uh, secured by the rest of the assets of the firm. Well, if the firm keeps pledging those assets to other lenders as security, then it lowers the amount of assets that are left over to pay the unsecured uh, lenders at the end. And so, of course, you don't want them to pledge those same assets to other people. It would be kind of like if I had a house. Let's say my house is worth $400,000, and I came to you. Let's start with Ms. Hofstetter. Um, my house is worth $400,000. It's totally paid for. Would you loan me $250,000 against that house? Yeah, of course she would. Now, I come over here to Ms. Flowers. Hopefully she was not listening. I have a $400,000 house totally paid for. Would you loan me $250,000? Sure. Sure, very good. Okay, and then I come to Ms. Raphael, and you didn't hear me talk to either one of them. I got this $400,000 house. I don't owe any money on it. Would you loan me two hundred fifty? dollars Yeah. Okay, so I get two fifty from you. I get two fifty from you. I get two fifty from you. I've got seven hundred fifty thousand bucks. Now, as long as I make the payments on all that money every month, nobody's the wiser. But do you think that's what these people do? No. I might make one or two payments just to give me a chance to get my stuff out of town. Right? Does that make sense? And so then I stop paying, and before long. Ms. Hofstetter decides she's going to come over and ask me about this situation. Actually, she, she comes over to, yeah, she comes over to the house that I pledged. She rings the doorbell. Of course, nobody answers because I'm long gone, right? And while she's ringing the doorbell, Ms. Flower shows up on the porch behind her. And Ms. Flower says, what are you here to do? And Ms. Hofstetter says, I'm here to get my house. And Ms. Flower says, wait a minute. What were you there for? 
<laughs> yeah, she's there to get the house. And these these two are just about to get into it when Ms. Raphael shows up. She's like, hey, what's going on here? And they both say, well, we're here to get our house. And you say, hey, it's your house. And then a three-way fist fight breaks out. Right? This is why we don't want to pledge the same asset to more than one person. Now, that what I just discussed there was illegal, right? Uh, it's called mortgage fraud. People do it. Not saying you should. Prison sucks. Okay. So you definitely would like to have this where they're not going to sell or lease major assets without the lender approval. And then finally in this list we have firms cannot issue additional long-term debt. Remember earlier I said that this is like the buffet and that you'd be very choosy about what you chose? Most firms would never do that last one and here's why. Because they are continually issuing new long-term debt to pay off old long-term debt. And so the firm can't make that promise, so of course they would not put it in the bond indenture. In fact, it would be very rare to see someone actually throw that into a bond indenture. Now, are all, all these are these all the positive negative covenants? Absolutely not. There are lots and lots of them. Um, but, you know, of course, your investment banker can help you walk through which you know, what covenants are pop popular and how much each one of them might help your yield to maturity drop. Now, what about positive covenants? Firms must maintain, what does the NWC stand for, Northwest Carolina? Networking. Networking capital, very good. At or above a stated minimum level. Why would a bondholder care about networking capital? That's short-term stuff. Ms. Hepp. Damn straight, if you die in the short term, you're not alive in the long term. Now, not only does, are you unable to pay your coupons if your networking capital is, right? But you're also unable to pay your suppliers. Let's assume they had enough money that they were gonna pay the bondholders. You're getting your 30 bucks, you're happy, but they're not paying the suppliers. What can the suppliers do? Can a supplier force a business into bankruptcy? Oh yeah. And so here you are, you're happy, you're getting your coupons, but they're not taking care of their suppliers, and so they go into bankruptcy, and you're now suddenly you're standing in this line you never wanted to be in. How can you avoid that? Well, they gotta hold their networking capital at or above a state of minimum level to ensure that they'll be able to meet those requirements. Secondly, the firm must periodically furnish audited financial statements to the bondholders. Now let's, let's look at this from two perspectives. First of all, why financial statements? Why do the bondholders need financial statements? Make sure the company doesn't go under. Okay, so you're, you're concerned about the financial condition of the company because you've loaned money to them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, take a look at number one up there. You gotta have minimum networking capital. If I don't have their financial statements, how do I know? Right, I gotta have their financial statements. Now, would you trust financial statements that you get directly from the company that have not been audited? No, no. So, let me ask you this question. Do you think people lie for money? Yes. Do you think people lie for sex? Do you think people would lie for chocolate? Yeah, and they would definitely lie for beer. So my point to you is this, people will lie for a lot lesser stuff, right? And so they're definitely, definitely, definitely willing to fudge their financial statements to help themselves out. In fact, that was the case they were pursuing against Donald Trump. I don't know if you guys are keeping up with this, but the New York City prosecuting attorney or something like that, they were after Donald Trump because they said he had inflated the value of his assets when he was going out to borrow money. They were having trouble making the case though because Donald paid off all the loans and the banks made a great profit. So it was just like it's a victimless crime according to his lawyers, right? Does that make sense? Okay, now that, that wasn't about politics, that was about inflating your assets. Okay, now why so, so we got to have them to be audited. What does audited mean? Do we have any accountants in here? 
She, so you know what audited financial, what are they? Um, whenever a company comes in and looks at your finances and makes sure that you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, so in theory, it's a third party, uh, so it's not the bondholder, it's not the uh, company. A third party comes in and takes a look at the company's financial, uh, financial books, basically. And what they do is they look at a random sampling of um, transactions and they make sure that they're correctly recorded and that the company is correctly identifying assets, liabilities, that sort of stuff. Now here's the problem. Who hires the auditor? The company, the company does. So let me, let me give you an explanation about how this works. The year, it's, it's uh, toward the end of 1997. I'm working at a facility in Dallas, Texas. Our auditor was Arthur Anderson out of Houston, Texas, the same people that brought us the Enron scandal. And they show up to do our audit. They were at our facility, which is a major facility. And I'm out there on the shop floor. At the time, I'm a machine shop supervisor. And I see this 23-year-old guy come walking down the middle of the shop and he's got on a suit and he's got on shiny shoes and he, he just looks totally out of place because there I am in my steel toe boots, my blue jeans, my polo shirt, my safety glasses and all that kind of stuff. And here comes this guy, looks like he just kind of comes straight out of a board meeting, 23 years old. And I see this warehouse guy that I know run up to him. And this warehouse guy says, are you the accountant? And you know what this 23-year-old guy says? Why, well, yes. Yes, I am. And the warehouse guy said, would you be interested in knowing that these people have about $2 million worth of inventory on the back dock that they're not going to enter into inventory until after the first of the year? The accountant says, why, well, yes, yes, I would be interested to know that. Now. Why was the company doing that? I won't name the company here. Why was the company doing that? Yeah, so they're trying to make their books look better. Uh, by the way, our managers got paid, some, one of their measures was inventory turns. So how do you keep your inventory low? At the end of every month, we did something called draining the swamp, where we got our inventory down artificially low. And then after the first of the month, we <gasps> bring in this stuff. Okay, so that's what's going on there. And so this accountant says, oh yes, of course I would be interested in seeing that. And so the warehouseman says, follow me. And so then the accountant follows, and of course morbid curiosity, I follow the accountant. The warehouseman goes down and he points to all this stuff sitting on the dock that hasn't been accepted in. And the accountant pulls out one of those disposable cameras. You guys probably don't remember these, but before digital cameras and phones, we had these little, <laughs> you'd see them on tables at weddings and you'd take pictures of each other and then the bride and groom would develop them later and say, whoa, they were really drunk. Okay, so <laughs> take all these pictures of the inventory. And then he says, thank you for pointing this out. And then he comes back out to the middle of the shop floor and he pulls out a huge cell phone because after all, it's 1997. And he calls and he starts calling around to the accountants at our other locations. Houston, Texas, New Iberia, Louisiana. There was one in Angola. There was one in Montrose, Scotland. He's calling around to all these places who are all being audited and they are all saying the same thing. The inventory is being held. They're, they're basically keeping their inventory artificially low. And so what happens? Now I have to start guessing after this point because the guy went up front to where the managing or the partner was that was leading the audit at our location. But here's what I think happened. He goes up and he says, uh, we've got this problem with the inventory. And he explains the, the, the inventory at our location. And the managing partner, or the partner at the location, probably says, eh, don't worry about it. That's not material. What does that mean? Yeah, it's not relevant. It's not significant enough to worry about. You know, we're talking about nickels and dimes here. Now, why would the partner want to say that it wasn't material? If it is material, what does he have to do? Document it. He has to document it, include it in the report, right? Okay. So then the young accountant says, you know, I thought you might say that. 
So I called around all the lo other locations. It's not just here, it's everywhere. And it's into the millions, several millions, maybe 10, 20 million bucks. Now this guy knows that it has to be material. By the way, I have a friend who used to be a CPA. He worked for Arthur Anderson. And he was going to um, audit a paper mill in Crossett, Arkansas. You ever been to Crossett, Arkansas? Tiny. Crossett, Arkansas. And he's getting ready to go down there and he asks the partner at his location, he says, uh, <clears throat> what will be considered material for this audit? And the manager says, well, if you get down there and the plant's missing, that's material. Pretty much anything else we can deal with. Don't you think there could be material things other than the plant being missing? Well, this guy doesn't want to report up the chain. Why? Because he doesn't want to lose the auditing business. Does that make sense? Because they're getting paid by the company. And so you get paid by someone and you tell them they suck. What do they do? So let's, let's play out this whole scenario. Um, the guy at my location calls the, the big wheel down in Houston. The big wheel down in Houston says to the people there, he says, hey, by the way, we've noticed that you, your company, you're not pulling in inventory uh, like you should. And this is a pretty major problem across all these different locations. And here's what the guy at my firm says. Thank you for bringing this to atten our attention. That's a very important thing to consider. He says, by the way, on a totally unrelated matter, we're thinking of getting a new auditor. Do you have any suggestions? What did he just do? Yeah. Do you think that ever showed up in the audit report? No. By the way, well, like I said, this is the same Arthur Anderson office that brought us in, Ron. So let you know about the high quality that you're getting out of there. Okay. Now let's talk about maintaining any collateral or security in good condition. You're loaning these people money, and let's say this machine is the security for the loan. Why would you want them to maintain it in good condition? Say again? Yeah, it might end up being mine. If these clowns don't make their payments, I gotta repo that thing. And by the way, you think I'm gonna take it home with me and make it my own? No, I'm gonna sell this thing. And if they haven't taken good care of it, then the value I'm gonna get out of that is gonna be lower. In fact, it might not be enough to cover the money they owe me. And so um, the, the bond issuer might put in there that they were going to maintain the equipment in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. And they might even give the ability for third party inspectors to come in and to validate that they've been doing so. Questions? By the way, most people that lose their cars in repos, do you think they're really great about doing oil changes? No. That's, I would never buy a repoed car. Let's talk about bond ratings. So, we've been talking about the risk of bonds. And we, we kind of like, would like a, know, a way to know how risky they are. And so we have these things called bond ratings. And your book says that they are just basically uh, about the default risk. That's not quite true. They are about default risk and the probability of recovery given default. So let's say that your friend borrows $100 from you and you say, okay, but I'm gonna hold on to your motorcycle until you pay it back. If your friend doesn't pay it, and let's assume this friend's a real scumbag with a history of not paying their debts, there's a good chance they're not gonna pay you. But do you care? No you've got a 100% chance of recovery because undoubtedly you can sell the motorcycle for more than $100 and then you can give your friend the rest of the money minus 100, right? By the way, are you really incentivized to get a lot of money for the motorcycle? No, you're just gonna get enough to get your money and then you know whatever's left over you're gonna give to your friend. Okay, so in that case, the probability of recovery would be high. But what if you were loaning someone money to develop an idea like research and development if they go broke what's your probability of recovering yeah it's near zero right and so you could have two 
borrowers that were equally likely to default. And one could have a very good bond rating because they have a high probability of recovery, and the other would have a very poor bond rating because of a low probability of recovery. So we have to keep both those things in mind. Now, who are the ratings uh, firms issued by, or who, who issues these? Well, we have these three uh, big ones. Well, two big ones, a medium one, and then there's a new one, and I, it's so unimportant that I forget the name of it. So the two big ones are S&P and Moody's, and then the, the, the other one is Fitch. You don't hear people saying really great things about Fitch because they're kind of like they're kind of like the uh, ugly relative at the family reunion. They just really, if if you want to get your bonds rated, you would prefer to get them rated by S and P or Moody's. Okay. So, who do they rate? Well, S and P, Moody's, and Fitch will rate the bonds of major issuers regardless of any relationship they have with them. So, for instance, if um, Google issues bonds, Alphabet issues bonds, then all three of these would come out with ratings on those bonds even though uh, Alphabet did not ask them to. Another example, they all rate Russia's debt. Did you guys know that Russia had bonds? Russia's like any other country, right? They issue bonds and of course those, uh, that debt has a certain risk to it. And we're going to talk about what recently happened to Russia's bond ratings, but do you think Russia paid S&P, Moody's, or Fitch to rate that debt? Absolutely not. It's a big issue, so any of the big issues, these people want to be seen as playing in that market, so they're always going to rate those. But what if you're a smaller borrower? Let's talk about city utilities. They're the people that provide electricity here. City Utilities, they were, so my friend Janet was the head of treasury at City Utilities, and they were going to build or add on to the John Twitty Energy Center, which is out on the southwest side of town. They were going to build a couple of new units. And so that's going to require many millions of dollars. And so they knew they needed to issue some bonds. So, of course, if you're going to issue bonds, you go to an investment banker and you talk to them. And the investment banker says, you know, you'd be better off to get these bonds rated. And Janet said, why would we get the bonds rated? And he says, here's the deal. Nobody outside of this town knows about city utilities. Nobody outside of this town knows how solid the finances are at city utilities. And therefore, nobody outside of this town is going to buy these bonds. And so if you want to increase the audience for these bonds, which you do, I'll explain that in a minute, which you do, then what you're going to want to do is to get them rated. Now, that issue is not going to be big enough to pull in S&P, Moody's, or um, Fitch without some sort of enticement. So city utilities had to pay them. Why would they pay them? Because if you have a rating, your yield to maturity drops and then your cost of borrowing drops. And the theory is that the cost of the rating is more than offset by the savings on the interest that you have to pay as a result of having your name out there as a solid borrower as rated by one of these three. Okay, now this all sounds uh, good and fun until we start thinking about a conflict of interest. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you three again because you're on the front row. Um, so I've got S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. And of course, they can't hear me talking to the other ones. So I, I come over here to S&P, and I say, <clears throat> I'm going to issue these bonds here in my financial statements. Um, I've got two questions for you. How are you going to rate my bonds? Or, and we'll just make two, two ratings here to make it easy, good or bad. And how much are you going to charge me? So how are you going to rate my bonds? Good. Good. She didn't even hesitate, right? And then how much do I need to pay you to get you to rate my bonds? A lot. Oh my goodness, we're not going to write a contract for a lot. How much? Throw me a number. A thousand. Oh my goodness. you got to think bigger than that, girl. Let's go with a quarter of a million bucks. Boo, there we go. Okay. Oh, by the way. Whenever someone asks you to do a study, and this is especially with, true mar with marketing, I have never seen a marketing study that was not a quarter of a million bucks. Right? If you come in and you say a $65,000 marketing study, they're boop, right? They're not even going to take it seriously. Ask for the money. Okay, on with the story. I come to you. You are Moody's. 
saying, you know, here's my financial statements, and you guys shoot these bonds. What is your rating on my bonds? Good, very good. And how much are you going to charge me? 300000 300000 okay. And I come to Fitch. Sorry to pick on you and make you Fitch. Are you going to rate my bonds good or bad? Good. Good. And how much are you going to charge me? Quarter of a million. Quarter of a million. Oh, now. Okay, this is actually really easy. Who am I not going to go with? Oh, yeah, I'll get to you in a minute. Ready. I'm not going to go with you because you asked 300000 right? And since you two asked the same amount of money, and you're Fitch, <laughs> I'm going to go with her, S&P, right? Now, what if instead she had told me she was going to rate me bad? I'd be right over here with these two, right? Does that make sense? And even if these two rated said they were going to rate me bad, she said she's going to rate me good, would I pay the 300000 Damn right I would. Does that make sense? And so there's this conflict of interest because once again, the person that's getting rated or audited is paying the bill. And if you look back to the mortgage, the financial crisis, we had a lot of those really crappy mortgage-backed securities, and they were getting triple A ratings from all three of these, from all three of these. And it was, the reason was that these people were making money hand over fist, slapping ratings on these. And in the uh, the investigations afterwards, what they found was these people had no idea how to assess the risk of those bonds. All they were doing was cashing the checks. Questions. So you wouldn't pay first, then get the reading? No, that's right. Well, so, you know, this is confidential off the record over drinks. I'm asking this kind of stuff. So what did you think when you looked at my uh, financial statements there? Right? Probably at some sort of hotel bar. Drinks are way overpriced. Questions? By the way, why do I not care about the drinks being way overpriced at the hotel bar? The company's paying, right? Very good. Other questions? Okay, see you next time. Okay, so if I remember correctly, we were talking about bond ratings. Is that right? Okay. So, um, we had talked about these as having a conflict of interest. Have we talked about investment grade and general? Okay, so let's move on then, and we will look at... Oh, come on. i got to turn it on. There we go. I'll learn something. Okay, so these are bond ratings. Now, for each of these... Uh, we've got, you see them in colors. And so let's, uh, anybody have color blindness here? Oh, excellent. Okay, so the top two are blue and green. Those are investment grade. Everything that's blue or green is investment grade. Everything that is yellow or red is junk. Also known as high yield. Okay, now here's a good test question. What's the highest rated junk bond? Double B. It's B, B, or if you were using the Moody's, it would be B, little a. And this is confusing. If you, if you look up at the top, we've got big A, little a, little a for Moody's, and big A, big A, big A for S&P. Everybody agrees that these things match up. And then we have big A, little a, and big A, big A, and everyone agrees this matches up. And we move on down, and it keeps looking that way until we get to the Bs. In S&P, we have big B, big B, big B, and then for Moody's, what do we have? I'm expecting big B, little B, little B, but no, big B, little A, little A. What the hell, Moody's? That doesn't sound right, right? It's confusing. Anyway, back to the story. Uh, each one of these has pluses and minus. Well, so not the triple A, it doesn't have a plus, but everyone can have uh, minuses and pluses and minuses below that. Um, but keep in mind that a BB plus would be considered investment grade because BB is the top rated junk bond. Okay, let's see. What else can I tell you about these? So as we work our way down here, you can see that they all match up until we get right down to the end and you can see a D over on the S&P side. D is for bonds that are already in default. What does that mean, they're in default? They stopped paying. Yeah, they've already stopped paying, right? 
And so what they're going to, what, so basically right now the bonds are in default. The debt holders can force them into bankruptcy. Now my question to you, oh, by the way, those are included as C over in Moody's. So you'll find those same bonds in C at Moody's. So the C category at Moody's is bigger because it also contains these Ds. But my question to you is, would you buy a defaulted bond? You can flip a coin. She says no. And why would you not buy a defaulted bond? <clears throat> yeah, they're not paying you. Like, why would I want that piece of junk? So here's the, the bigger question I want to pose to you. If you want to take over a healthy company, what do you buy? It's stock or it's bonds? Stock. Yeah, you buy the stock. What if you want to take over a sick company? You buy the bonds, right? And so, because after they default, then, oh, come on. Oh, I'm here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so after they default, who gets to take control of the assets? We just talked about it last time, folks. It's only been two days ago. Who takes control of the assets when the borrowers default? The lenders, in this case, the bondholders. So if I want to take control of this company, all I have to do is I see that it's sick. <laughs> and so I go out, I buy the bonds, and then I just wait. This is called vulture capitalism. Vulture capitalism. Does everybody know what vultures are? What do vultures eat? Dead animals, Dead animals right? And, uh, and typically kind of stinky stuff is how they get drawn in, right? Okay, but vultures have this amazing sense. So let's assume that on spring break, you are going out west and you've decided you want to check out Death Valley, which by the way, the name kind of tells you what's going on there, right? You go there, your car breaks down, and you decide to walk for help. And after a while, you notice these vultures circling you. What do the vultures think is gonna happen? They think you're gonna die. Now, who's more likely to be correct on this thing, <laughs> you or the vultures? On whether you're gonna die. Really? This is their job every day. This is your first time to try this, right? So the vultures are circling. They're waiting for you to die. That's why we call this vulture capitalism. Let me give you a couple of examples. Number one, a man named Wilbur Ross. He saw the sorry state of the United States steel industry. Uh, we had, they had really fat labor contracts that were dragging them down. They had a lot of, of you know, debt and whatnot. And so all that needed to go away in bankruptcy. By the way, bankruptcy is great for getting rid of not only your debt, but it also gets rid of existing labor contracts, which will also come into play in my next story too. Anyway, what Wilbur did is he went around and bought up the bonds of these companies for you know pennies on the dollars, because after all, they're dead ducks, right? And then he waits for them to die, and then he takes them over, and then he puts them all in together into one company, and then he renegotiates contracts with the union. And by the way, if your choices are coming back to work at the steel mill for half your previous wage or working at McDonald's, what do you think you're going to choose? I mean, you used to make about 70 bucks an hour and now 35 or McDonald's, right? Nothing wrong with working at McDonald's, but I would rather work at the steel mill. Okay, so he goes out and he renegotiates all of his contracts. And so now United States Steel, well, that's, I think that's the name he chose. Anyway, this, this company is now a going concern again. Another example, how many of you know about Hostess Twinkies? Oh yeah. If, if you want a, a golden bar of goodness covered with a thin layer of grease, that's the, the Hostess Twinkie. And how many of you remember a few years back that Hostess went bankrupt? 
oh yeah, Osis went bankrupt and there was this big deal of everybody trying to snap up all the Twinkies they could because it was like the freaking end of the world because Osis was going bankrupt. And my wife and I were talking about this. I said, there's no way that they're not gonna come back because that's just too good of an asset. So what drove, if it was such a great asset, was such a great business, what drove Hostess into the ground? Well, there were a couple of things. Number one, the management was under-investing in the business. So they weren't innovating with products. They weren't uh, keeping up with technology. So they're using the same old 1950s crap to turn out the same old 1950s stuff, which, you know, everybody loves a ding-dong, but hey, you need to innovate, right? And so that's what, uh, what happened. And the other thing is the, the labor agreements. So Hostess was making cakes and they also made bread. And the labor agreement said, you can't put bread and cakes on the same truck. And so to every grocery store in America, two Hostess trucks would show up. One, yeah, it's kind of stupid, isn't it? One with bread and one with cakes. Well, the neat thing about bankruptcy is it gets rid of those contracts and so they can renegotiate all those contracts when they go back into business and so someone did the right thing did vulture capitalism on this deal scooped up the assets of pennies on the dollars and then came back into business and since then they've been investing in the facilities they've been um, re uh, innovating with the products just the other day I saw some ding-dongs that had instead of having uh, chocolate cake inside they had caramel cake inside. I thought, if I was like five pounds up from where I want to be, I would have bought those, right? Okay, so there's some, that's a beautiful story. Does that mean though that every sick company that you could do this with, you think you could do it with just any sick company? No. They need to have a solid business model underlying them. Let me give you an example of a company, and I, they may already be dead but a company that had no solid business model under it, just basis, basically because of changes in what happened. So back in the uh, early mid nineties, when I first started flying for business, there were a couple of things on airplanes that were interesting. One, there was a phone on the back of the seat and you could uh, swipe your credit card and for about 10 minutes, $10 a minute, you could call your mom or your business associates or whatever. Uh, the only other thing that phone was good for was you could call Sky Mall for free. You guys ever see the Sky Mall catalog? Sky Mall, okay, so the Sky Mall catalog. So let's keep in mind what I'm gonna paint a picture for you here. No uh, smartphones, no iPads. Uh, if you had anything to do on the plane, it was like reading a cheap novel you bought at the newsstand while you were waiting on the plane. And by the way, your plane's been delayed, so you probably got three quarters of the way through the book before plane ever took off. And so there's no entertainment. So what do you do when you get on the plane? Well, you finish your novel, you have a couple of drinks, because after all, you're bored. And then you get to looking at Sky Mall. And so what kind of things did they have in Sky Mall? Well, one of them was a, a six foot Sasquatch statue. Life, but they called it life size. I assume Sasquatch is taller than six feet, but I digress. So they got this life size Sasquatch statue that you can order and they'll deliver it to your house and they say it makes a great lawn ornament, right? And so there you are, and by this time you've had a few more drinks and you're really bored, you're really lonely, so what do you do? You pick up the phone, because there's only one person you can call for free and that's Michelle at Sky Mall. And at first you're just gonna talk to Michelle and ask just general curiosity questions about Sasquatch, but before long she's talked you into Sasquatch and you buy Sasquatch. Then you get off the plane, you pile yourself into a taxi, you go to your hotel and you go to sleep. And then you get a call from your wife or your husband like weeks later while you're on the road and they're like, did you order Sasquatch? And you say, oh man, I must have really been out of it, right? Okay, so that's Sky Mall. It's a catalog full of stuff you don't need and the prices are like way too high. So you, anything you see on Sky Mall that you like, go look at it on Amazon, you get it for like one third the cost. Now, back to the story. Why was Sky Mall a good business model then? Because of all the things that I mentioned, lack of entertainment, the phones in the back of the seats, whatnot. How many of you have flown on a plane where they had phones in the back of the seat? Yeah, I didn't think so. So that's gone. 
And then the airline said, wait a minute, those SkyMall catalogs uh, weigh a lot when you put them all together, and that's burning, that's costing us fuel. And so they were wanting to get rid of them. And so basically SkyMall becomes a kind of a dead business model, or at least a dying one. And so if you saw SkyMall and it's on the teetering on the verge of bankruptcy, would you buy up their bonds? Absolutely not. Just let them die, right? Does that make sense? So it has to be a good business model. And it basically is a good business model ran into the ground by incompetent managers. That's your best bet for vulture capitalism. Okay. I think that's all I wanted to say about bond ratings here. Do you have any questions? Can anyone tell me what the highest rated junk bond is? Double B. By the way, double B is the same as uh, Big B, Little A in Moody's. But you know, they, I'll, I'll, always refer, I'll always refer to uh, S&P first, because it's, we always talk about S&P and Moody's. So let's talk about some different kinds of bonds. First of all, we've got some government bonds. And we've got many, many, many kinds of government in the United States. But as far as debt goes, we only break it into two categories. There is the federal government debt, which is the central government out of Washington, D.C. that covers all 50 states. And then there's everything else, which we're going to call municipal debt. It's a federal uh, debt. They, we've got different types. And the first is something we've already discussed about, and that is the Treasury bill. The most popular one is the three-month Treasury bill. This thing has no coupons. That means it is a pure discount loan, which means I'm going to buy this thing for 996 bucks in expectation of collecting a thousand three months from now or something like that. So that's the treasury bill. Then we have treasury notes and the notes actually have semi-annual coupons as do the bonds. And we're going to figure out that the difference between notes and bonds is time to maturity. But what do we know about federal bonds, these, these federal debt. Uh, they're all free of state taxes, but not federal taxes. So here's what happens. The federal government says to the states, states, you can't tax the interest on these bonds, but we will. Does that sound a little cheesy on their part? Yeah. So that's what they're doing. They're saying you don't have to pay state income tax on this, uh, but they are not free of federal taxes. So. Who would this be more attractive to? Someone from Missouri or someone from Texas? I'll give you a hint. Missouri has a state income tax. What about Texas? No, they don't have one. And so treasury, uh, treasury would not be as attractive to someone from Texas simply because it's not saving them anything on their taxes. Does that make sense? Okay. So, let's see, uh, we've covered the, the federal. Let's talk about the municipal. So, municipal, I said every other form of government in the United States, and not even just governments, but special districts like the Springfield School District, sewer and water districts, even city utilities of Springfield, our electricity provider, can issue these bonds. Now, these bonds are weirdly free of federal tax. Now they're, so they're local stuff, but they're free of federal tax, uh, but, uh, and they may also be free of state tax. So for instance, as a citizen of the state of Missouri, if I buy Missouri municipal debt, it's tax-free at both the federal level and at the state level. But if my mother-in-law who lives in Arkansas were to buy the exact same bond, she would be free of federal taxes, but she would have to pay Arkansas state tax on that interest. On the other hand, she could buy a bond from Arkansas and be free of both kinds of taxes. Now, why do we do that? Well, in theory, it's to get people to invest in their own state, but it really just kind of crimps the market down a little bit. I, I don't think it's a great idea. Go ahead. How do you know if it's gonna be free of state tax? You look at your state's tax code, right? She asked an excellent question. First of all, we know if it's Texas, it's state tax-free because there's no state tax, right? But uh, she asked a good question, and that is, how do we know? And the answer is, never trust what your finance professor says in class regarding tax law, right? You always wanna go and look at the latest and greatest on your taxing authority's website. For federal purposes, who is that? 
IRS, very good. By the way, you guys need to do your taxes. We're coming up on that, right? Um, the other thing is if you, so state of Missouri, it's called Department of Revenue, but you can just Google Missouri tax, Missouri state tax, and it'll come up. They, so used to, you had to get your hands on a paper document. You'd actually have to go down to the library and hope that they had one on the carousel of papers, but now what can you do? Just download it, right, PDF? Oh, she has another question. Sorry, this might be stupid, but why would someone buy these bonds? Like, why would a one person buy these? Oh, very good. So we're going to get that to the to that in the next slide. But the, the bigger question right now, since we're talking about this tax thing, is why would the federal government make these things federally tax free? What are they trying to encourage? Let's talk about what these bonds are typically used for: building a new sewage facility, building a new highway interchange building uh, the hyperloop between Kansas City and, and St. Louis. Like that's not, that's never gonna happen by the way. But all of these things are basically, a lot of them are infrastructure. And infrastructure is supposed to help increase economic activity, taxable economic activity. And so basically what they're trying to do here is stimulate the economy and of course, the economy's job is to provide jobs for you all, but uh, along the way, they're actually kind of planning for more taxes down the road out of this. I'll give you an example. It wasn't that many years ago that uh, in China, the roads were really bad and the produce was being grown inland. And so all the fruit farms, vegetable farms, things like that were inland, but most of the people live on the coast. And so it was, there was trouble getting the produce from the farms to the coast before it went bad. And so what did make it to the coast sold at a very high price because it was kind of rare, right? Supply and demand. The government goes in and builds good roads from the agricultural areas to the coast. And now the fruits and vegetables can make it there quite quickly, they're fresh, so more vegetables and fruits are for sale, therefore the prices are lower. Um, it's, it's kind of a win-win-win all the way around. And by the way, do you think the government's getting uh, more tax revenue as a result? I hope so, all right? Okay, so that's the reason that they're giving this tax break on these bonds is to try to stimulate infrastructure investment, which will hopefully help us out down the road. Questions? Okay, now we are getting close to what Ms. Flowers asked about. What does that tax-free status do to the required yield to maturity? And this brings us first to the big question is, what do people really want? What do people really want? What do people really value? And I'm gonna give you an example from your own lives. You get a paycheck. How many of you have ever gotten a paycheck? Oh, good. So you get the paycheck and there's that big number at the top, right? And you're looking at that and you're all excited. And then you realize there's a bunch of stuff. And you're like, who's Fika, right? <laughs> and you get down to the bottom and you get maybe a little more than half of what you actually earned. Between those two numbers, which one is more important to you? Yeah, the one you actually, the, the way you actually receive, right? because that's what you get to spend. Now, by the way, when you're at your class reunion, this is the number you talk about, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about how much you can afford to buy a house, you know, this, it's this little one, right? That's the same way with these bond investors. They're interested in after-tax return, after-tax return. Now, the cool thing about municipal debt is because you can get them basically tax-free of all kinds of taxes, uh, the before tax return is exactly the same as the after tax return. But that's not true with taxable bonds like those issued by corporations. If you buy a bond from Apple, you're going to pay taxes all the way around on that bond. You're going to pay federal, you're going to pay state. So um, those bonds, you need to think about, well, how much of this am I going to lose to taxes? And so I have to multiply the interest on a taxable bond times one minus T to figure out what my after-tax return is gonna be. And what is T? It is your marginal tax rate. You guys remember the difference between marginal and average tax rate? 
marginal is what you're gonna pay on the very next dollar. And after all, this bond income is gonna go on top of your current income. And so it's gonna be at the marginal tax rate. Now, here's the fun thing, and now we're getting really close to your question. And that is what happens to people's tax rates as they make more money? What happens to their marginal tax rate? Yeah, it goes up. I think right now we're at 39.6% is the highest possible. So we could just round that to 40 and, and consider this to be 1 minus 0.4, which is 0.6. So if you had a taxable bond with a 10% yield, you're really only getting 6%. Does that make sense? Because you have to pay 40% of that in taxes. But you could have a, a municipal bond that paid 6% and you wouldn't have to pay a bit of it. And so those bonds, as long as they were otherwise equal, would be equally attractive to you. And so that's what we're looking at here is how do I compare two bonds? If I've got the taxable bond interest, I can multiply it times one minus T and that would tell me what an otherwise identical municipal bond would have to pay in order for me to think it's attractive. If the municipal bond is paying any more than that, then I buy the municipal bond. If the municipal bond is paying less than that, then I pay, I get the taxable bond. You could also rearrange this to something called the taxable equivalent yield. I sub T equal I sub M divided by one minus T. So just a little algebra there. Here's just something called the taxable equivalent yield. And then you could look at a municipal bond and see, well, uh, what, would an, an other, what would an otherwise identical taxable bond have to pay to be at least that attractive? And if your taxable bond paid more than, than I sub T, you would choose the taxable bond over the municipal bond. Okay, so um, people with high incomes have high marginal tax rates, and therefore they're the ones that are interested in this. So does that answer your question, Ms. Flowers? What kind of people would be interested? The answer in short is rich people. Yeah, so uh, 1992, there was this guy named Ross Perot, big ears, pointy nose, squeaky voice, runs for president and he says, you guys aren't paying enough taxes. We got too big of a deficit. And he just really goes on and on about this. And then it comes out that the man has all of his wealth invested in municipal bonds. How much taxes was Ross Perot paying? Michael, hey, look in the mirror when you talk about who's not paying taxes, right? Pal. By the way, he didn't win the election, but he did allow Bill Clinton to become president. There's Ross Perot's contribution to history. Back to the story. When my wife and I first moved to Springfield, this is back when people had landline telephones. And the phone rang and I picked it up. And it was this guy. He says, this is Roger from Edward Jones. You guys know what Edward Jones is? What's Edward Jones? Yeah, well, like brokerage, yeah. investments. Guy calls me up, he says, uh, Dr. Haggard. I said, yes, because I'd only recently become doctor. Still kind of sounded cool. <laughs> he says, Dr. Haggard, um, I was wanting to talk to you about municipal bonds. I said, hang on just a minute. And I covered the mouthpiece of the phone and I turned to my wife and I say, honey, we've made it. Edward Jones thinks we're rich enough to care about municipal bonds. And I say, Oh, Roger, thanks for your call, but no thanks. Have a good day. And I hang up. <laughs> so, there you go. By the way, my brother-in-law. Let's talk about my brother-in-law. Um, smart guy, drives a truck. Um, he has four kids. What do you know about tax deductions for kids? There are a lot. And so by the time he gets all the tax deduction for his kids, his marginal tax rate is zero. Do you think he would ever be interested in owning a municipal bond? No way, man. Now, maybe after the kids leave home, but today he is not interested in that. Now, uh, let's think about another group that might, that won't be interested in municipal bonds. How about pension funds? Pension funds don't pay taxes on what they get off of anything, right? Because they're, they're basically, they're tax advantaged retirement savings kind of thing. As a result, would you ever see a, a pension fund investing in municipal bonds? No, no. And so what we're looking at are 
rich people basically is your, your core clientele for these municipal bonds. Questions? Do you think municipal bonds are default risk free? So let's ask this question in a different way. Can a city go bankrupt? Oh, absolutely, cities can go bankrupt. Oh, yeah. So Orange, Orange County went bankrupt when I was, I think I was in college. And then um, recently, didn't Detroit go bankrupt? I think so. And so, yes, yeah, totally possible for um, a, a community to go bankrupt. And so these are not default risk free. So if you're gonna buy these things, what should you do? You should hold a diversified portfolio of them. Don't just buy all bonds for the Flint, Michigan Water District. Do you guys know why that's funny? Oh, actually, it's terribly not funny. <laughs> Their water's horribly polluted, right? You can't even drink it. And so what if 10 years ago you said like, yeah, I'm gonna go all in on the Flint, Michigan. <laughs> yeah, you'd be in a world of hurt today, right? Questions? Okay. So let's talk about zero coupon bonds. We talked a little bit about them when we were uh, talking about how to price bonds. By the way, unless we're told otherwise, how do we price the zero coupon bonds? Yeah. So, okay, so it's the uh, face value is a thousand. Very good. What else? How often do we assume they're paying these zero coupons? We know they're not, right? Twice. Yeah, oh. we're assuming though semi-annual compounding, and it really it comes down to just the compounding is the only difference between this. And so when you're pricing these things semi-annual, so we discussed how all the principal and interest are paid back at maturity, and the next line says must always be a discount bond. Now, when I originally put this slide together many many years ago, that was absolutely true. But then something weird happened. We had a financial problem and everyone is scared snotless that they're gonna lose their money. And so people then with uh, more than F the two FDIC limit of $250,000 on their savings account, people with real money start pouring money into very safe things like United States government uh, treasury bills and the basically the identical thing from Germany. Germany is kind of a safe borrower. Now, if a bunch of people want to buy, if a bunch of people want to buy the same thing at the same time, what happens to the price of that thing? It goes up. It goes up. And it turns out that these people bid up the value of those things so much that they actually became premium bonds, which means their yield to maturity was actually negative. And so in essence, what these people were doing were paying the American and German governments to keep an eye on their money until everything settled down. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. Let's see. We have, we have some other names for them. We call them zeros or deep discount bonds. Typically they're selling for a lot below par value simply because you've got such a long time until they pay and then that, that payoff at the end has to cover both the principal and the interest, which means that you are, aren't willing to pay as much for these bonds. Questions? Okay, now something else that I said earlier is that the coupon rate on a bond tends to stay the same over its life. This is an exception, the floating rate bond. And the way floating rate bonds work is they have some sort of benchmark that they, they look at. Like the 10, it's usually like the 10 year United States Treasury um, yield to maturity. And every six months, what they do is they take a snapshot of that and then there's an adder, like 3% maybe. And this is all, of course, in the bond indenture an adder of 3%. And then when they, they come up with that number, 10, 10 year plus 3%. That gives you the coupon rate for that six month period. And so that's what determines how much the coupon, how the coupon gets paid. So as a result, what happens is the coupons go up and down pretty much at the same rate as the yield of maturity. Remember we said if a bond's yield of maturity and coupon rate were identical, how much does the bond sell for? 
Face value. You are on fire today. Face value. Yeah. And so here's the idea. These bonds are always going to sell for around a face value. And so that takes some of the interest rate risk away from the borrower, right? Because uh, they don't have to worry about it. if interest rates go way up that their bond value is going to plummet. But if I take away risk for the borrower, that means they are going to demand a lower yield to maturity. And so we're going to see that these floating rate bonds typically have a lower required return because it's safer for the bond holder. By the way, if the bond holder isn't, isn't dealing with the interest rate risk, then who is? The issuer. Yeah, the issuer is because they're the ones that has to pay these giganto coupons if interest rates go up. Of course, on the other hand, we know interest rate risk goes both ways. What if interest rates just crash? Oh yeah, right? If you're the bond issuer, then you're thrilled. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's see here. How about convertible bonds? Convertible bonds, they can be converted from debt into equity. Let's talk about just a regular old bond. Uh, what is the upside to owning just a regular old bond? Let's discuss why there is no upside to this. The, at best, what you're going to get is the promised set of payments. I'm going to get the coupons, 30, 30, 30, 30, and at the end, get the 1,000. Times are bad, but the company's not going bankrupt. They pay the coupon. Times are a little better. They pay the coupon. Times are great. They pay the coupon. Do you see that you're really not getting much of an upside on, on bonds? However, uh, you are kind of protected from the downside because after all, when times are bad, unless they're in really bad shape, they're still gonna pay that coupon. Now, what if, uh, let's compare that to equity. What happens to the stock price as times are good and bad? Kind of goes with them, right? Positive beta, that stock's gonna go up and down with the economy. Negative beta is gonna move in the opposite direction of the economy, but either way, you're exposed to risk. And so you could buy a bond and hold on to that bond, and then if, uh, if times were good, you'd really like to be able to convert it into stock. And that's what convertible bonds allow you to do. What you can do is you can trade in each bond for a certain number of shares. Let's say that the stock is currently trading at $35 per share, and they are selling convertible bonds that convert one bond into 25 shares. What's each bond's face value? Oh, come on, you know. Yeah, it's a thousand. And so if it converts into 25 shares, what does that mean the price per share is that this, this conversion reflects? What's a thousand divided by 25? Swing in a mess. Oh, sorry. That doesn't divide by 25. I believe it's 40, but check my math. I believe it's 40. So that means that uh, basically I'd be better off if I wanted the stock right now, I'd be better off to go out and spend $35 a share and just get the stock versus buying the bonds and converting them. So when is it advantageous for us to convert these bonds? The answer is when the bond price or when the stock price rises above 40. Now, would you, after you see it goes up to $40.01, would you say, woohoo, and convert your bonds? No, here's why. Number one, you can't go back. This is a one-way conversion. You're not going back. And so you wanna make sure that you're ready to convert. Because what could happen if it goes up to $40 and one penny, and then something say like Russia invades Ukraine? What could happen at the share price? Mr. Zach, what do you think is going to happen to the share price? Yeah. It's going to go down. And suddenly you're like, oh man, I should have just held on to that stupid bond. So my advice to you is hold on to the bond until you're ready to sell the stock. And that way you can convert the bond into the stock, immediately sell it, locking your gains. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, a convertible bond is like a regular bond, only it's got a lottery ticket stapled to it. That lottery ticket, you know, if things take off with the share price, you can convert and get rich. Do people pay money for lottery tickets? 
Yes, that one's a pretty simple one, right? They will pay money for lottery tickets. Do you think people would be willing to kind of pay extra to have this, this convertible option? Yeah, and the way they pay for it is with a lower yield to maturity. The way they pay for it is with a lower yield to maturity on the bond. So they're willing to accept a lower yield to maturity in exchange for the potential of this, this big win on the backside. So if I were a manager, by the way, remember, managers are working to maximize shareholder wealth, not bondholder wealth. So if I am the CEO of the company and I'm deciding on issuing bonds, if everybody else thinks the stock price is about to go through the roof, but I know better, I issue convertible debt because it has a lower yield to maturity, right? It's gonna cost me less. And I don't have to worry about those bonds getting converted into shares and diluting my other shareholders. Does that make sense? Does that sound kind of sketchy and skeezy? So what does that mean when someone tells you, oh, hey, we're getting ready to issue convertible debt. What should you think? Hmm, I wonder, I wonder if that's a good deal. Okay, then we have put bonds. You guys remember the callable bonds, the little old ladies down in Florida that got called out, right? Okay, so the callable bonds gives the bond issuer the right but not the obligation to buy the bond back. A puttable bond gives the bond holder the right but not the obligation to force the borrower to buy the bond back at a discount from the face value. Let me say that again. A puttable bond gives the bond holder, the bond holder is the one with the option this time, gives the bond holder the right but not the obligation to force the borrower to force the borrower to repurchase the bond, to repurchase the bond at a discount, at a discount to face value, to face value. So here I, I buy a puttable bond. It's got a thousand dollar face value and they tell me that they're willing to buy or that they'll buy this bond back at any time for 900 bucks. So that's a discount from face value. When would that option become valuable to me? If the bond price fell lower than 900, I could sell the bond for 900 and it would be a floor on my losses. I'm not gonna lose more than, theoretically, I'm not gonna lose more than 100 bucks on this bond. Now let me tell you why I say theoretically. What kind of situation might lead to the bonds only being worth 1,000? Well, there could be an overall increase in interest rates in the economy. That would be one thing. But what if something bad has happened to the company and the reason their yield to maturity is going up is because they're at higher risk of going bankrupt now. There's a chance that they won't be able to raise the money to buy back your bond at 900. But it still is a form of insurance. It might be beneficial. And so as a result, people are willing to accept a lower yield of maturity on put bonds because they are, in theory, safer. People are willing to accept a lower yield of maturity. Now, let's get back to the manager. How would a manager decide when it was time to issue put bonds? Well, everybody else thinks the company is going into the toilet, but I know different, right? If I know that things are gonna go well for the company, I'm not gonna have to worry about this 900 floor on the bonds. And so I'll go ahead and issue the put bonds and it allows me to borrow at a less expensive price because I'm basically, because I'm giving these people insurance, right? They're, they're paying for the insurance, but I don't have to worry about it because the company's not going to go under. Does that make sense? Okay. I really should do a study and see what happens after issues of put bonds and callable bonds to see, or convertible bonds to see if what I'm saying is actually put into play by people. Of course, I always start from the, the assumption that people are scumbags, right? So let's talk about bond markets. Bonds are sold over the counter. And when we talk about over the counter markets, what we're talking, let's, let's take you back in time. 
There used to be a time when you would go into your bond dealer and there was an actual counter. And when you would go in, you'd say, I'd like 10 General Electric bonds, please. They'd say, just a minute. And they'd go get the bonds and they would sell them to you over the counter. That's why it's called that. Does that make sense? You may have heard over the counter with medications, right? Like Tylenol and whatnot. It means you don't have to have a prescription. Well, here it's talking about, they literally handed you the bonds over the counter. Okay. Now, they are therefore sold through dealers. They are not sold on exchanges. So a dealer, what is a dealer? They, they hold an inventory and they stand ready to buy or sell. If you are a dealer and you're holding an inventory and you stand ready to buy or sell, you are said to be making a market. Why are you making a market? Because anyone can, can do any transaction that they want with you. They could either buy or sell. So you, in effect, have made a market for that particular security. So if you're holding an inventory on any particular bond, you are making a market in that bond. Okay, so where do the dealers get these bonds? Well, uh, there's actually a schedule of how often the United States government um, buys or sells debt. By the way, do you think the United States government, you know, like takes long hiatuses from borrowing money? Like, yeah, it's all good now. Taxes are covering everything. No. And so we have a schedule. You can set your watch by when the United States government is going to issue additional debt. They, so these dealers, in fact, the, the government has uh, several dealers that they like to basically work with to get this stuff out there. And then uh, these same dealers may be working with companies. They'll buy part of the new issuance of bonds that come out of companies. Now, you as an individual can actually go out there and bid on United States government debt, but I would tell you not to do it. And here's why. You are likely going to offer too high of a yield to maturity and so you'll end up basically, uh, you'll, you'll end up in, in a bad way. You don't want to do that. You don't want to go out there and buy that stuff. So what I would do instead is go ahead and let a dealer buy it because they're going to negotiate. They're going to get the right price on it, right? And then go buy it from the dealer. What's, what's the additional cost of buying it from the dealer? The bid ask spread. What do we mean by the bid ask spread? A dealer says, I'll sell you the bond for this ask price and I'll buy bonds for this bid price. And so that's how the dealer makes their money, by the way. The ask has to be higher than the bid, right? And so if we subtract ask minus bid, that's called the bid ask spread. I think it should be the ask dash bid because it's ask minus bid, right? But that's how they make the money. But it's tiny, it's a tiny amount. It's not very big. You're gonna see it on the next slide that it's not very big at all. So don't, don't, don't go out there and think you're gonna get a bargain by dealing with the United States government on your own to try to buy debt. It's just not gonna happen. Okay, and we've already talked about making a market. By the way, how do dealers differ from brokers? Dealers actually take possession. Brokers do not. Does that make sense? So we know the dealers getting paid with the bid ask spread. How are brokers getting paid? Starts with a C. Commissions. They're getting commissions. So here we have a bond quote. And we have all sorts of different things up here, but let's talk about how this works. So over here is the maturity date for the bond. And you can tell this picture is a little bit old, but it's the where everything works the same way. Next thing is we have the coupon rate. And when we were talking about the coupon rate, we said it's a percentage of what? The coupon rate is stated as a percentage of? Come on, people. I'm gonna have to come back to Ms. Flowers because she's been right every time today. Ms. Flowers. What do I multiply the coupon rate by to get coupons? Uh, <clears throat> oh, swing and a miss. Say again? Yes, or we would call it the face value or par value. Yeah, very good. I'll bet you know you got it now, right? 
Okay, so here's the deal. These coupon rates up here, that is percentage of face value. It turns out that that's the same way that bonds are quoted. And so these prices that you see under bid and ask are all percentages of face value. They're all percentages of face value. Let me say that one more time. Bonds are quoted as a percentage of face value. Now, that allows us to do something pretty cool. If you remember, we talked about current yield. And we said it was the annual coupon divided by the bond's price. And we know that annual coupon is the coupon rate <coughs> times the face value, which I'll just say FV. And then this bond is, it's just a quoted price, quoted price, times the face value. So what happens to face value here? Yeah, it just cancels out. And so, if you're looking at one of these quotes, all you got to do to figure out the current yield, which remember is not the same as the current yield of maturity, to get the current yield, all you have to do is take that coupon, divide by the asked. Why are we dividing by the asked? If you go out there to buy this thing, what are you going to pay? Remember, the, the dealer stands ready to sell at, they are asking a price, that's the price you're going to pay. They are bidding a price, that's the price they will pay to you. Which one are you gonna pay if you go to buy this bond? Mr. Zach, the ask, yeah. Okay, so now we understand how those things are, are uh, quoted. And then uh, the change. Change is also percent of face value. Change is also percent of face value. Now, notice here that all of these changes are red. What does that mean? In the United States, is red a good color when discussing financials? It's down, right? Mr. Wong, this is different than in China. Yeah, oh, it freaked me out the first time I'm in China and I'm standing there and we're watching stocks and stuff and, and you know, you can read the room, right? And so there are all these Chinese people and suddenly the boards all turn green and I'm like, yay! And they're all like, <laughs> because it's opposite in China, because red is a lucky number. Uh, red's a lucky color, sorry. Eight's a lucky number. Four's a bad number, rhymes with death. Back to the story. So that means these are all decreases. If the bond price has gone down, what does that mean must have happened with yield to maturity? Yeah, it had to have gone up. So we know that interest rates went up uh, on the day that this snapshot was taken. And then finally, we have the asked yield. That is the yield to maturity for this bond, for the bond, based on the asked price, based on the asked price. And why are we basing things on the asked price? Because that's what you would pay if you went to buy this thing. That's what you would pay if you went to buy this thing. Okay, <clears throat> let's see. Don't think there's anything else. Oh, let's let's look at these coupons over time. Look at the maturity of these bonds. You can actually see that the coupon fluctuates with time because these are all like 30 year bonds. And so you can look at what was the coupon when certain things happened. And so what happens is when people issue bonds, what they try to do is they try to size the coupons such that the bonds sell for face value. In other words, they're trying to say, okay, what yield of maturity are these people going to be requiring for this bond? We think it's gonna be three and a half, so we'll put three and a half percent coupons on this bond, and if we get it just right, the darn thing sells for exactly 1,000 bucks. So, what does that mean? You can actually kind of do um, interest rate archeology. span If you look at bonds going back in time, or ones that are getting close to maturity, you can see what was happening 30 years ago. So, but definitely, it's not the same every time. Questions? Okay. Definitely know the difference between bid and ask for the exam. Definitely know the difference. Okay, let's talk about inflation and interest rates. 
And we're going to talk about two kinds of returns, nominal and real. Let's talk about real returns first. Real returns talk about your actual increase in your ability to consume. So let's uh, assume that at the beginning of the year, I had enough money to buy 10 pepperoni pizzas. And at the end of the year, I had enough money to buy 11 pepperoni pizzas. I could figure out my real rate of return as 11 minus 10 divided by 10. And so it tells me that I've got 10% return because I'm able to buy 10 more percent more pizza at the end of the year as a result of having made my investment. Now, what about nominal returns? Nominal returns talk about the number of units of currency that you're going to get as a result of having made an investment. And so if I put $100 in the bank at the first day of the year, and I can pull out uh, 110 at the end, I get 110 at the end, that gives me a 10% nominal return. Now here's the big question though. Does that really represent your ability has to purchase things has gone up by 10%? Only if prices have stayed exactly the same. Do you guys see what the latest inflation number is? 7.9%. What are your chances that the price of your pizza is gonna stay the same? Pretty much zero, right? It's interesting, my dogs get groomed every four weeks. They probably need it more often, but I'm cheap. They get groomed every four weeks, and uh, every time we drop the dogs off, I say, so how much is it? And, and the girl says, 70, because for two dogs, they're, they're not big dogs. And I say, okay. And I keep expecting them to raise their prices. Now, none of you please tell my dog groomer that they should be raising their prices, right? I just keep expecting it because you know the shampoo they're buying is going up, the electricity they're buying is going up, the gas to heat the place is going up, their costs are all going up. You would expect them to raise prices, but they're not. That is an unusual occurrence and a sign of a not so great business person. Great dog groomer, not so great business person. Now, what does this mean for you? It means that thinking about nominal returns really doesn't help us that much when we're talking about buying power. I remember 1994, I was sitting with some uh, colleagues around a table and we were talking about how much, and we're all like early 20s, and we're talking about how much we need to retire. I said, I want two million in my retirement. And they're all like, two million? That's a boatload of money. I'm like, yeah, but keep in mind at that point, cheeseburger and fries is gonna cost like $16. It's getting pretty darn close, right? So I'm, I'm shooting for more than two million now, cause dang, right? Okay. So we have to keep our mind on real returns, but how do we find real returns? Because all the things we see in the economy are nominal. For example, the return on the S&P 500, it's a nominal number. When you talk about putting your money in a savings account, that interest rate, nominal. All the rates that we observe in the market are nominal rates. By the way, that's a great test question. All the markets that we observe in the market, all the rates that we observe in the market are nominal. And the reason is, when people are willing to, or thinking about loaning you money, uh, they're, they're trying to predict what inflation is going to be over the term of the loan, and they're going to adjust what they're asking you for in order to make sure that they get the same real rate of return that they want for their money. And so the real rate of return might stay the same, but that nominal rate of return is going to change based on inflation. Okay, so... How do I convert? It's something called the Fisher effect, and it has three variables in it. Number one, it has big R. Big R is the nominal rate. Big R is the nominal rate. That's the one that includes the adjustment for inflation. Little r is the real rate. That's the one that talks about your ability to, to increase your consumption. And then H, oh my goodness. What do you think H stands for? What's the other thing we've been... Yeah, that's inflation. And you say, why not I? Why do you think we might not use I here? What else might we use I for? Interest. Yeah, interest rates, so it confuses people. 
Uh, there's one other thing you may see if you've had Dr. Witty's class. Dr. Witty, I think, uses pie. Confuses the fire out of people because what have you grown up thinking fire pie was? 3.14159, right? So I never use pi, I always use H, even though it's not inflation, it's just inflation. Does that make sense? Okay, now here's a cool thing. I can solve for any one of those things. So all I have to do is give you two of them and ask you to solve for the other one. And so uh, it's, it's a magical thing called algebra. You guys should all know how to do it by now, but just in case you don't, have a friend who does help you to solve for each one of those things and then um, put it on your note sheet. Does that make sense? Okay, let's see. Now, down at the bottom, I shouldn't even tell you this because, uh, so I was giving this exam to China EMB yesterday and I saw this guy write on his, his uh, exam, R, big R equal little r plus h. And I told them expressly, never use that on my exam. Never, never, never use that on my exam. So I want you to, right now, right next to, to this, do not use this for exams or when there's real money at stake. Do not use this when there's exam, when it's an exam or there's real money at stake or for your homework. <laughs> so you ask, Ms. Flowers is like, where, where would you use this? The answer is simple. I know that after class you guys get together and you have a few drinks and you're talking about real rates of, in, of return, you're talking about inflation and nominal rates. When you're doing that, you're back of the cocktail napkin calculations. It's perfectly fine to do that. But here's the problem. That if we, if we expanded out the Fisher effect, what we'd see is that big R is equal to little r plus h plus r times h. Now, if inflation is zero, it works perfectly fine. If the real rate of return is zero, which we hope doesn't happen, then it's perfectly fine. But the bigger R and H are, the greater the distance between the exact and the approximation. So always, and by the way, when do we talk about this kind of thing? When inflation's big, right? And so you gotta, you kind of gotta always use the exact, don't use the approximation. Questions? Okay, let's talk about the term structure of interest rates. First of all, let me tell you what this is. It's based on United States government debt. And here's what they do. They take a 30-year United States Treasury bond and they break it into its component parts. And these are actually, you can buy and sell these. They're called strips, the separate trading uh, blah, 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 I forget, but strip stands for, but basically it's they take uh, the bond and, and you could buy a certain coupon, you could buy another coupon, and basically it makes means that they're all zero coupon pure discount bonds, right? And so every interest rate up here then, it doesn't have any sort of interference from uh, coupons between the time that you buy it and the time that it matures. And it also doesn't have any default risk because after all, theoretically, the United States government is default risk free. Does that make sense? Okay, now the picture at the top is what we call an upward sloping term structure. Upward sloping term structure. And that's typically the way these things work. You've got low interest rates in the short term and higher interest rates in the longer term. But how do we get to that? It turns out that there's kind of a layer cake here. On the bottom, we have the real rate of return, and we have no theoretical reason to believe that the real rate of return that people desire changes with time. So one year, five year, 10 year, 30 year, all the same. And so that's why that bottom piece is perfectly flat. And then on top of that, we have our inflation expectations. And so if we expected inflation to stay constant, we would expect that to uh, basically just be flat. If we expect inflation to go up, then we've got a rising there. And if we've got inflation going down, like we're gonna see in the next one, then you'll see that slanting downward. And then on the very top of that, we have the interest rate risk premium. If you had nothing else but interest rate risk, you would still have an upward sloping term structure because we know that the longer something's outstanding, the more interest rate risk you take on. Okay, 
So this at the top is a money-making machine for banks. Think about this. Banks tend to borrow money on the very short term. Checking accounts, savings accounts, certificates of deposit, that sort of thing, right? They're borrowing on the, the short end, which gives them a low interest rate that they're paying. But then they're loaning money out on the long end, like a 30-year mortgage, and they're charging higher interest for that. And so that is how they make their money. They're borrowing a dollar uh, for a nickel a year down here and lending it out for 12 cents a year over or here, right? And so that difference is where they make their money. It's all fun and games until, check out the bottom one, the downward sloping term structure of interest. Now, suddenly, banks' business model is upended because they're having to borrow money at very high interest rates, and those 30-year loans that they've made that are out there, way out there, they're still only bringing in, say, 7%. And so this is a good way, this bottom one is a good way for us to have a crisis where banks fail. And I've seen this at least twice in my life, at least twice in my life, where this thing persisted long enough that it actually destroyed some banks. I think the late 70s and then again the late 80s, we had savings and loan troubles. Okay, now let's talk about how this bottom picture happens. The Federal Reserve, our central bank, has two missions. Apparently whoever came up with their missions did not listen to my speech on only having one goal, right? They've got two missions. Number one, maintain full employment. Number two, maintain steady prices, which means mild inflation. So they, sh they usually shoot for around 2%. How does the Federal Reserve kill inflation? Well, let's talk about what inflation is. Inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And so how can I get some of that naughty money in off the street? All I have to do is hire, offer a higher interest rate. So example, the year is 1978 or so, my grandpa is driving this ratty car and I'm like, Grandpa, your car sucks. You should get a new one. And he says, are you kidding? He says, I'm getting, I forget what percentage he was getting down at the bank on his money. He says, why would I pull my money out to buy a new car when I'm making so much money on it? It was because the short term interest rates were quite high because inflation was high. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, but if it pulled in the money off the street, right? He would have been out there buying a car, except for he was too busy making money. And so that's how we get the money in off the street. Now, how does the Federal Reserve do that? Federal Reserve has a magical power that nobody else has. And that is the power to create and destroy money at will. I should say US dollars. To create and destroy US dollars at will. How do they do that? If they want to push more money out into the market, what they do is through open market operations, they go out there and they buy United States government debt and that pushes money out into the market. If they want to pull money in off the street, what they do is they push United States government debt or they sell United States government debt and it brings money off the street. And so this is what they're doing. This is how they're kind of manipulating these interest rates. So what's going on here is a situation like we had in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when a man named Paul Volcker takes over the Federal Reserve, and he has a, a conversation with Jimmy Carter, who, by the way, uh, can be quite well documented. He's one of the worst presidents in history. But he did at least two things right. Number one, he deregulated the airlines. And number two, Paul Volcker said to, uh, Jimmy Carter said to Paul Volcker, can you get inflation under control? And Paul Volcker said to him, yes, I can, but it will cost you the next election. And to his credit, Jimmy Carter says, go ahead, fix the problem. And he lost the next election. But back to the story. Paul Volcker comes in, and what does he do? He raises interest rates on the short term quite a, quite a, quite a bit, and it pulls money in off the street. Now, causes a recession, a recession that lasts all the way into Ronald Reagan's term. It was bad, my dad almost lost his job. Remember the difference between a recession and a depression? In a recession, your neighbor loses their job, in a depression, you lose your job. So, so luckily, my dad got to keep his job. But the point is, when we see this, we're gonna see a couple of things. Number one, we're gonna see banks fail. 
Number two, we're probably going to see a recession. Now, the question for you is, where are we at right now? What do you think the Federal Reserve is going to do? By, by the way, we have the highest inflation in 40 years. What do you think, what do you think we're headed for? Say that. Yeah, they're about to push interest rates up, especially the short-term ones, to get money in off the street. Now, that would be the full story, except for, do you remember that other mandate? Full employment? When we do this, what happens to the economy? We have a recession. When we have a recession, what happens to people's jobs? People lose their jobs, and as a result, we end up with, uh, you know, they, they can't really do both at the same time. And so I can't tell you what the Federal Reserve is going to be doing, because right now we've got so much risk in the economy because of wars and pandemics and you name it. It's, it's all there. The, I, the worst job in the world right now, except for maybe president of the Ukraine, has to be uh, being in charge of the Federal Reserve, because no matter what that guy does, he's going to take a beating. Questions? Okay. Let's cover this one and then get out of here. Term structure of interest. So what determines bond yields? Well, the first thing is that layer cake that we just talked about. But keep in mind that that didn't have any default risk in it. So we're going to have to throw default risk premium. So corporations have a tendency to default on their loans sometimes. So we got to charge a higher yield maturity for that. Then there's a taxability premium which we can think of as uh, what's going on here. Instead of thinking of municipal bonds selling at a discount, we can think of taxable bonds, the yield of maturity has to be a premium. And then there's finally what your book refers to as the liquidity premium, but I'm gonna call it the illiquidity premium because illiquid bonds are the ones that have to pay a higher yield of maturity. I will demonstrate this to you with a poignant story. There is a young man he has $25,000. He goes to his broker. He says, I've got $25,000 I won't need for five years. What should I do with it? And the broker says, well, I've got two five-year bonds or notes right here. This one pays 6% and this one pays 7%. And the young man says, why does this one pay 7%? And the broker says, well, this other one is freely traded on the market. You could get in or out anytime you want. But this other one is Springfield School District you're going to have to hold that for the whole life because there is no market where you could just easily sell that bond if you wanted to. But if you don't need it for five years, go ahead and do this one and get the higher coupons. So the young man says, okay, and he buys the 7% bond. That night he goes home and he's having dinner with his girlfriend and his girlfriend says, I've been thinking, by the way, gentlemen, when a woman says I've been thinking, yeah. Uh, it means you're going to have to spend money, do some work, or probably both. But back to the story. She says, I've been thinking we should get married. And the young man says, I've been thinking the same thing. And then the young woman says, I've been thinking I need an engagement ring. And the young man says, I've been thinking the same thing. But then he says, what, what kind of ring? Are we, where are we going to get this ring? And the young woman says, oh, I'm very reasonable. I want a ring from Cartier. You guys know Cartier? Let me translate this to more Americanese for you. Tiffany? <laughs> okay, so fancy jewelry store where you're gonna pay way, way, way more than you should for a ring just so the person can say, oh, I got it at Tiffany, right? Back to the story. The young man says, I have some good news. And the young lady says, what's the good news? And he says, I have 20. Oh, she, and he asked how much it's gonna be and she says 25,000. He says, I have $25,000. She says, great. He says, you just have to wait five years. How do you think the story ends? I'm going to put it in an optimistic way. The young man gets a new girlfriend. Huh? <laughs> That's the danger of illiquid bonds. That's why they have to pay a higher yield of maturity. Questions? All right. See you next time. Have a good spring break.